Hello everybody, Sandra Delaja here. I'm back with you with this new with this topic that we've been dealing with. Are black African people cursed? Are African people cursed? Are blacks cursed? And this is what we've been uh, examining for some weeks now. And today we are going to continue to talk about Egypt. Yesterday I spoke about the fact that Egypt was the greatest civilization. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, Egypt was the civilization of the black people. That it is the black people that uh, created Egypt. And it is the black people that, um, may, you know, that built Egypt. Today I want to talk about the greatness of Egypt. And that Egypt is the greatest civilization of the ancient world. It's the greatest. Now the Nubia and Ethiopia was the first civilization of mankind, right? But it reached another level when they migrated to the north and built Egypt. And they made Egypt to be the greatest civilization of the ancient world. But the first one was the Ethiopian or Nubia civilization. So we have found out who the ancient Egyptians were. Please go and share the message if you, uh, if you don't mind, share the message and invite your friends. So we already found out who the ancient Egyptians were. And we can see the achievements of Egypt in a new and true light as achievements of black Africans. Because we already found out that the ancient Egypt was a, uh, a land of black people. That's how they call themselves. Dark skin land. A land of blacks. Before the Greek people changed their names to Egypt. This is the matter of principle that we had to make clear above. That the achievement of the ancient Egypt is the achievement of the black race. Now, let us enjoy an excursion of the majestic Egypt. In the pre-dynamic period, the Egyptians already imported gold, silver, copper, tin, lead, iron, red iron, or uh, corundum, galena, turquoise, uh, 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 volcanic glass, serpentine, lapis lazuli, coral, and tortoise shell. From these materials, they produced beautiful and useful works of art, which was dis destined, to destined to inspire, surprise, and bring admiration in the following centuries. The first golden age of Egypt is the historical period known as the Ancient Kingdom. It is this era that is glorified as a milestone in the construction of the Egyptian, Egyptian pyramid. And this is before the arrival of Europeans and before the arrival of Arabs. These structures in particular, the three of them located, in, located mainly on the Giza Plateau, appear to be the most enduring architectural structures in the world today. These objects of architectural craftsmanship remain a source of reverence, reverence surprise, and inspiration. As the Arab proverb goes, the old world fears time, but time fears the pyramids. <laughs> the French uh, emperor Napoleon Bonaparte calculated that there was enough stone in the Giza pyramids to build a wall measuring 10 feet in height and one foot in width surrounding the entire country of France. And as you know, I've already told you that there is a wall that was built in uh, Bikulisi, Bikulumisi or something, Bikulumiku, uh, somewhere in Yoruba land, in the Jebu Ode area. Uh, a wall that we, that we have found out that the amount of stones and the earth uh, sound that was used to build that is called the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Sheba Shrine in the Jebu is the amount of wall that, I mean, the amount of fee, uh, sound that is used to build a wall is more than the amount that is used to build the pyramid. So because it is the same kind of people who built them, the same people who migrated from Nubia and Ethiopia to who migrated to the north, they are the same people who migrated to the west. And they were able to use similar technology to build 
that wall in Ijebu, in Yoruba land. The mathematician monk who was among the servants accompanying Napoleon on this campaign is alleged to have confirmed this calculation. The occupation of Egypt by Ethiopia served as the beginning of the first Egyptian golden era, golden age. According to the British archaeologist Flinders Petrie, the conqueror of Sudanese appearance founded the Third Dynasty, as a result of which many completely new ideas penetrated the country. You see, so when we talk about Sudanese, um, Ethiopians, we are talking about the same people. If they're the same, we are not talking about Sudan of today, and we are not talking about. Uh, uh, Ethiopia of today. We are talking about a nation that was just one without territory at that time, without borders. And it was just a nation of black people. Just one black nation, continent of black people. That's what he's talking about. That when those people conquered and colonized Egypt, that is when they were able to build all those things we see in Egypt today. This new movement reached its culmination in the days of Pharaoh uh, Cheops, who laid the foundation for Egyptian development. By itself, that Pharaoh was a black man. By itself, the pyramid of Cheops, the most perfect geometric form in architecture and the only survivor from among the seven wonders of the world, is the largest single building ever built by man. Until 1,300 years, it was the highest building in the world. Wow. Architectural works performed by the uh, Egyptians required mechanical and technical knowledge that even modern professionals are still trying to explain. <laughs> Herodotus describes that the pyramid was built for 20 years and that it had inscriptions that showed how many radishes, onions, and garlic the builders had eaten. <laughs> Look at the about the precision. The amount spent on these products was 1,600 talents of silver, that is 40,000 kilograms of silver. Wow. In this case, Herodotus was amazed how much more was required to purchase iron, iron tool that was used, food and clothing for workers, taking into account the duration of the construction process. The French astronomer Thomas Moreau, director of the observatory in uh, Bogui, in his book, The Mysterious Science of the Pharaohs, insists that the Great Pyramid was used as a repository for storing scientific instruments, weight and length standards, and not as a grave. In place of the uh, sarcophagus, there is a granite slab which serve as a standard of length. The length of this plate is one tenth million part of the distance from any pole to the center of the earth. My God. This constant value, which was only recently determined by modern scientists, is the basis of the metric system. Thanks to this figure, the Egyptians were able to calculate the most accurate uh, circumference of our planet. <laughs> parameter of our planet. The height of the Great Pyramid, pyramid is one billionth, one billionth of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Wow! This distance could not be established by scientists with the utmost precision until 1874. Corridors of the pyramid point precisely in the direction of the polar star of that time to a turban. The ventilation corridors of the south side to the star Sirius and from the north side to the star Alnitak. The Grand Gallery, one of the components of the pyramid, could be used as an equatorial telescope of a modern astronomical observatory. The Egyptians probably knew about the golden section and the uh, P number because these were reflected in the proportions of the pyramid. When studying the pyramid, a number of very precise proportions were found, such as the exact duration of the year, 
the constant procession, it is a. As a result, Professor Charles Smith, Pianzi, and Dr. Alfred Russell Wallace noted that such precision in the construction of the Great Pyramid would require the best modern measuring instruments. <laughs> As the southern and northern sides of the pyramid were made with concavities and the shadow of the sun disappears during the equinox, this explanation was made by Professor Andre uh, Potion, born in uh, uh, 1891 year, why the Roman poet Decimus uh, Ausonius, 310-394 uh, AD, wrote, The pyramid itself swallows the sh shadow of, of noon. It is noted that slaves were not used for construction, but it was rather a perfectly organized construction process. 100,000 workers were employed for three months <laughs> for the transportation of stones. Wow. This work took place where there was a rise in river water levels and there was nothing else to do for the people. The transportation and preparation of the place took 10 years to complete. The actual construction took another 20 years to complete. <laughs> the Egyptians were both a prosperous and highly moral people. The existing images on the monuments describe all aspects of the life of the Egyptians but there are no violent or debauch scene there. The punishment for killing a slave was death penalty. There was no other similar law in the times of slavery, either in ancient or in modern times. This indicates the value which the Egyptians attached to human life. Another sign of civilization was that soldiers did not carry weapons except for the period of service. Ordinary citizens did not carry weapons at all. Women were treated with great respect during the feast. During the feast, great guests were met by the host and hostess who were sitting side by side in a large armchair. Their figures show mutual love between them. Their gentle manners, gestures of caress and kindness to children created a warm and touching picture of family life. And this is where this, these are all things that indicate what that these people were civilized people. And you know, this was before the white people came and before the Arab people came, these were black people we are talking about. Civil law functioned in such a way that the poor were protected by law on an equal basis with the rich. The judges received large salaries, thereby removing the temptation to take bribes. They, treated, they treated with honor the symbol of truth, which they used to wear around their necks on a gold chain. From the kingdom emerged such illumina, illuminaries as Net Jericat uh, Year of Rule, uh, okay, before Christ, the first recognized royal personage to commission the construction of a large monument in Houston. Bejme, the noted African shipbuilder, Noamed Sneferu, the benevolent king, during whose reign the classic pyramid form appeared. Kafre, years of rule, okay, who built the second Giza pyramid and may have had the face of on, on market. Uh, rendered in his own likeness. Menkaure, years of rule, you see there, builder of the third Giza pyramid. And you see, if you know, you see that these are not Arab names. These are more African names. A, a Sire, chief of dentists and physicians. Sahure, who launched the first recorded Kemetic expedition to Punt, Ghostland in Eastern Africa. Uh, pa Hotel, pa Hotel, author of profound pres, uh, precepts of morality and ethics set forth in the first preserved philosophical works. Unas, whose tomb chamber was the first to be inscribed with the religious literature now known as the Pyramid Text. 
Pepe II, another southerner who's 94 years on the throne, is the longest documented reign in the human annals. We would like to single out uh, Imote, Imotep, who is considered the first known architect in the world, in the world history, and a scientist. He designed the first stepped pyramid, was an astronomer, architect, prime minister of King Joseph, uh, the chief doctor of the monarch. The authority of Imhotep uh, in subsequent period of Egyptian history was so great that it was considered the greatest sage of all time. As a magic that he had a magical power. Imhotep is also credited with the foundation of Egyptian medicine. In particular, he is considered the author of the Edwin Smith Papyrus, a fundamental medical research. This papyrus was the first to determine the real causes of many diseases. A famous Canadian medical practitioner of the uh, 19th century, William Osler, called Imhotep the father of medicine and the first medical practitioner whose personality comes from the fog of antique, uh, antiquity. Imhotep is the initiator of the movement of protesting scientists as evidenced by his words. The scientist does not need to be instructed on how to cook green sponge. Earlier sources of this saying or uh, his counterparts have not yet been found by archaeologists. His other saying is eat, drink, have fun, for tomorrow we will die. The era of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, which is 2000 years before Christ, was also founded by noble descendants from southern Egypt. This period was also marked by grand engineering and architectural achievements. You know what is southern Egypt? That is the people from this, that is the black, the Ethiopian people. Characterizing the work of this time, the founder of Egyptology, John Francois uh, Campoleon, said the Egyptians built as if they were 100 feet, 30 meters high. <laughs> Pharaoh Amene met the third, uh, raised two major pyramids at Dakshu and Hawara. The one at Awara possessed a sepulchral uh, chamber of yellow quartiles, 22 feet long, 8 feet wide, and 6 feet high. The total weight of the chamber was 110 tons. The roof of the chamber itself was composed of three massive pieces of yellow quartzite with a combined weight of 45 tons. Amazing. Around Lake Karum, a vast embankment was constructed, which, according to Egyptologist Jim Breasted, was 43 kilometers long and secured over 11,000 acres of fertile land for cultivation. The lake was turned into an artificial body of water joined to the Nile with a canal. A great dam was built, which regulated the mighty river's flow and this minimized the risk of a poor harvest. Nearby, there were two 12-meter-high statues of the king. Fragments of these statues can still be seen in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, England. In his stone, a magnificent polished, polished pink granite sphinx of Amenent uh, II, African king of Egypt, is the most spectacular attraction of the Egyptian collection in the Louvre, Paris. These are all from my book. These are all from my book, uh, How Africans Brought Civilization, How Africans Brought Civilization to Europe. That is where I wrote all this. This is where the, all this is coming from. In St. Petersburg, Russia, there are ancient Egyptian as sphinxes of the pharaoh Amenhotep 
the third, today on display on the university embankment. To the south of the Karun Lake to the so-called Labyrinth. According to Herodotus, it may have been the largest single building in the ancient times. Hmm. That is the Labyrinth there. The lower part. Labyrinth. Herodotus wrote that the Labyrinth surpassed the pyramids. And let me quote him. I have seen this building and it is beyond my power to describe. It must have cost more in labor and money than all the wars and public wars of the Greeks put together. Wow. In facing of the building was composed of quartz and alabaster, giving it the appearance of white marble. This huge complex with 12 individual courts was dedicated to Sebek, Sebek the crocodile-headed deity sacred in the Fayum or Oasis. The labyrinth contained 3,000 rooms, 1,500 below the ground and 1,500 above. Wow! <laughs> 3,000 rooms. The building itself measured 800 to 1,000 feet. <laughs> Archaeologist uh, F. Petre, who conducted excavations of this site said the mere figures will not signify readily to the mind the vast extent of construction but when we compare it with the greatest of the other Egyptian temples it could be somewhat realized on this on that space could be erected the great hall of Karnak and all the successive temples adjoining it and the great court and pillars of it, and also the Temple of Mut, and also the two great temples of uh, Lux, uh, Luxor, and still there will be room for the whole of Remesium. Hmm. In short, all the temples of the East Bank of Tibet, and one of the largest on the West Bank, might be placed might be places together in the one area might be placed together in one area. The great inventions made by Egyptians include alphabet, paper, ink, pen. They are credited with the invention of the art of shaving, wigs, hats, and pillows. They made the first paper from thin cane strips of papyrus connected together. The ink was made from a mixture of vegetable glue, soot, and water. Writing was invented and its influence on the development of civilization is invaluable. According to the historian James Breasted, the invention of writing and convenient writing on paper had a greater impact on the development of the human race than any other intellectual invention in the history of mankind. This was more important than all the wars and, invent and all invented devices. The next great invention of the Egyptians was the calendar. The early Egyptians counted the time by the moon, but the lunar calendar was not accurate. Subsequently, they found this inaccuracy and invented an improved calendar consisting of 365 days a year. Local astronomers even calculated that the true length of the year was 365 one quarter days, but they did not include this adjustment. In addition, it was the ancient Egyptians who invented the star signs, representing a fairly accurate structure of celestial bodies in the sky. This knowledge was preceded similar knowledge found in other subsequent civilizations. Now, you should know that we are talking about black people here, because at this time, there were no white people in Egypt, and there were no Arabs in Egypt, only black African people. Herodotus noted that the Egyptians who lived in the uh, cultivated parts of the country by the practice of keeping records of the past had made themselves the most learned of any nation of which he had ever experienced. At the time of his heyday, Egypt dominated over the whole of Africa and Eurasia. 
we have seen that humanity began its development from Africa. Africa has also created the first civilization called the Ethiopian civilization and the greatest civilization of the ancient times called the Egypt, called Egypt or the Egyptian civilization. They invented writing, iron melting, and other key attributes of civilization. Further on, we will see in what other parts of the world African civilization has spread its influence. All right. So we are seen a lot and heard a lot of what the Africans have done. It's just impossible to explain anything further because I'm just reading from my research and from the book that I've written because nothing to explain. This is just historic, historical documents and documented history. So if you don't have that book, go get it, How Africans Brought Civilization to Europe. I think every African needs to have this book. Every black person needs to have this book in their house. So if anybody says anything, you just bring out the book. Well, uh, <clears throat> please go share this message. Go share this message with your friends and family members. After uh, I finish this, we'll still do a video. Uh, we'll show you one of the videos that will also show you about the, civil the African civilization. Uh, for those of you who want to come to History Makers Training, please go to my blog, sondadilajablog.com slash HMT, HMT. And for those of you who want to join my mentorship program, which is free on, online, you also go to sonadilajablog.com slash mentorship. If you want to go with us to Africa to rebuild a greater Africa in to Nigeria, go to my blog as also and just go to sonadilajablog.com slash Nigeria. So for Nigeria, it's slash Nigeria. For books, it's slash books. For H HMT, it's slash HMT. For mm, mentorship, is slash mentorship. So, you know, we are going to be happy to, to have you. And uh, if you want to read my book for free, you can do that as well if you register for Kindle Unlimited. Uh, or you could buy them on Amazon as well. So uh, we are going to go to the video now. I'm going to show you some video that will further affirm what we have been talking about, about this African civilization. All right. We'll continue tomorrow. See you. Okay, when we talk about who the ancient Egyptians were, there's consensus that Egypt has been invaded over half a dozen times. I haven't even included in this list the Ottoman invasion, I haven't included the French or the British invasion, it all came after this. But the Arab invasion in the 7th century of the Common Era, then the Vandals, which is where the word vandalism came from, because they was a bit mad, uh, to use the technical term. Uh, they, that came in the 5th century, they had Germanic, German people. Then the whole of North Africa, not just Egypt, was a Roman province. Before that Greek, before that Persian in 525 BC. At the most conservative estimate, ancient Egyptian history, pharaonic kingship, begins in 3100 BC. I say most conservative because I don't actually agree with that chronology, because my teacher Robin Walker, big shout out to the OG, taught me that there's reasons to disagree with that chronology. But nonetheless, if we go with the most conservative estimate, can we see that the Persians still got to Egypt two and a half thousand years after the founding of ancient Egyptian kingship? So who was living in northeast Africa prior to all of these invasions from people that are not from Africa? Well, let's see. The ancient Greeks saw the ancient Egyptians for themselves. They were in Egypt during the Persian invasion, and of course, then when they ruled Egypt for a little while. Let's see what some of them had to say. Next slide, please. Theodorus of Sicily. General Histories, Book 3, 30 BC. Now the Ethiopians, for those who don't know, Ethiopian literally means of the burnt face. It wasn't an insulting term, it was a generic term for black person, yeah? Back in the day, and it referred to generally all of Africa, and even the Greeks used it to refer to parts of India. If you go to India today, in southern India, you'll find people, some people, as black as any people in Africa. So it shouldn't surprise you if that term was used, but it was a generic term meaning black. Now, the Ethiopians, as historians relate, were the first of all men. The proofs of this statement, they say, are manifest. They also say the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians. Now, can you see, we're told modern science discovered that Africans were the first people on the planet. But here is an ancient Greek historian saying that Africans were already saying we were the first people on the planet in 30 BC. Herodotus, the father of history. There can be no doubt but that the Colchians are an Egyptian race. Before I heard any mention of the fact from others, I'd remarked it myself. My own conjectures were founded on the fact that they are black-skinned and have woolly hair, Afro. Yeah? The Colchians, by the way, are a group of people in southern Russia at the time. 
whole host of other Greek scholars, including Aristotle, and there's loads more I could have put, seem very unconfused about the ancient Egyptians' ethnicity. We can't have it both ways. Either the ancient Greeks were one of the most intelligent, civilized people ever, or they were so stupid they couldn't recognize the colors of people they saw for their own eyes. But we can't have it both ways, you see? Next slide. Now, here are some uh, Egyptologists. It's important for us to understand the way early Egyptology evolved. When the French came to Egypt and colonized Egypt, it was in the height of transatlantic slavery, late 1700s, the Napoleonic expedition to Egypt. The Sphinx, the pyramids, all of these things are newly rediscovered. And immediately, the French are like, uh-oh, we've got a bit of a problem here, because we have an economy based on the pseudo-scientific pseudo idea of racism, based on the idea that some races, namely the white race, an invention, is superior to other races, particularly the black. And the discovery of an ancient African civilization, thousands of years before there was anything of comparable stature in France or England, not an insult, just a fact of history, created some problems. Now, some scholars immediately reacted to this by saying, okay, well, clearly racism's nonsense. Hooray, we can do away with such a stupid idea. Of course, foreign policy realized this wasn't terribly convenient if your economy depends on racialized slavery. So even though some honest, honest scholars came out and told the truth, many scholars went against this, and you're going to see how ridiculous some of the explanations got. Champillion, not the main Champillion, but the brother of Francois Champillion, had the following to say, I'm not going to read it all, but if you look closely, he says that Volney's basically chatting rubbish, there's no way the ancient Egyptians could have been black. But let's get to the end, and this is how funny it is. Listen to this part. Volney invokes that of Herodotus, who recalls that the Colchians had black skin and woolly hair, yet these two physical qualities, black skin and Afro hair, do not suffice to characterize the Negro race, and Volney's conclusion as to the Negro origin of the Egyptians is evidently forced and inadmissible. Now, he didn't offer any evidence. All he said was having black skin and woolly hair doesn't make you black. And if we go back into the racial science of the day, you will understand that it was actually argued by otherwise intelligent people that there were two races of black people. There were Negroes and there were Hamites. Hamites were any Africans that didn't look absolutely stereotypically what we think of West African people to supposedly look like. Anyone that has a slightly thin nose or any kind of straight hair or any features randomly that we decide was a Hamite. And Hamites were responsible for all of the civilization in Africa and they descended from Europeans. Negroes, on the other hand, they were the real black people. And even when we find evidence of Negroes, we'll just say they were Hamites, as you have here. This is how silly and how ridiculous ideas, pseudo-scientific ideas like race make otherwise intelligent people behave. Next slide, please. This is one particular comment, one of my favorite. He said, there are a people now forgotten, discovered, while others were yet barbarians, the elements of the arts and sciences, a race of men, now, of course, like most sexist men, he used men, but he meant all humans, because um, we just normalize that kind of language, men to represent all of humanity, now rejected from society for their sable skin and frizzled hair, founded on the study of the laws of nature, those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. Again, two early Egyptologists saying very much the same thing. Egyptian civilization is not Asiatic, but African in origin, of Negro origin, however paradoxical this may seem, we are not accustomed, in fact, to endow the black or related races with too much intelligence. So Pro Professor Abi Amelou straight away hit on what the issue was. Francois Champillion, the founding father of Egyptology, the man who decoded the Rosetta Stone, what did he have to say? Because apparently, according to National Geographic, the only people that think the ancient Egyptians were black were crazy Afrocentric black people. But let's see. The Egyptians belong to a race quite similar to the Kenuus, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, or Barbarous, present in Habian inhabitants of Nubia, Sudan. In the present Copts of Egypt, we do not find any of the characteristic features of the ancient Egyptian population. The Copts are the result of crossbreeding. Seems normal when a country gets invaded, there's interbreeding. The people that live in America today are not representative of the ancient indigenous Americans for the most part. Even though those people still live there, the average citizen of New York does not look like the average American 500 years ago. With all the nations that successively dominated Egypt, i.e. the Greeks and Romans, it is wrong to seek in them the principal features of the old race. And I could go on ad infinitum of Egyptologist after Egyptologist, who even if they felt compelled to racially abuse the ancient Egyptians, which many of them did, some of the art historians talk about how can you ever say their carvings are nice when they're so obviously Negro, Many of them, scores of them are like, well, obviously they were black, that's why they were uncivilized. So Egyptologists were presented with this real problem. Either ancient Egypt was civilized and European, or uncivilized and African. And very few of them acknowledged that it was both highly civilized, highly technically advanced, and also African, but a few of them 
it did. Next. I'm not going to come here and pretend to you that it was a feminist paradise, but what we do know is there were five female pharaohs, women could inherit and bequeath property, and of course we had female physicians. Medical specialisation, shipbuilding and expeditions, copious amounts of literature in poetry and prose has survived. There is three great volumes of ancient Egyptian literature published by a scholar called Mary Lichtenheim. I suggest you look them up. In addition to the coffin texts and the pyramid texts and others. Next slide, please. 